Welcome, everybody. If you thought you had a tough lockdown in 2020, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine today who we were in ministry together in the early 90s. Both of us worked for Colin Urquhart and studied at Colin's Bible School. And then in November 2019, an incredibly traumatic and difficult event took place in David's life. And I've read his book, I've cried through most of it, and I just wanted all of you to meet David Hazeldean and let him tell you his story. So, uh, David, how you doing, mate? Very good. Nice to see you after it all these years. <laughs> it's really good to see you, mate. Um, yeah, look, I don't want to steal your thunder. Tell your story and how things unfolded from November 2019 and kind of lead us yeah. through it. Well, the first chapter in the book is a bit of context, and that context is roughly having met each other at Roffey, uh, you left for ideas. I went went on to do youth work elsewhere in High Wycombe, lots of community work, stuff in London, planted to the very small church and deprived community, always with a heart for revival, longing to see God's presence come. And I felt God call me into the Baptist church ministry. So I went through ordination at um, Oxford University and was there for three years and then plump, was based in two churches. And my second church was in Belvedere in southeast London. And I've been there three years. And then on the 2nd of November 2019, the uh, this dramatic thing thing happened, which literally was left of fear. We didn't even realize what, why this would be happening. But um on the morning, I woke up with a, a bizarre headache all over my head, front to back, not just, you know, with your front. Mm, yeah. And I tried to have some tablets, drink some water and get rid of it. I scuppered my prayer time that morning. I couldn't really pray. And I woke up again later on and was still there. And as I walked into the bathroom to just go to the before I get some more tablets, I had not unknowingly, I had three strokes. I felt suddenly dizzy and lost my balance and almost fell over my eyes went in front of my right ear went fuzzy and i stumbled back to bed and dived over sam my wife and uh, then progressively throughout the next five six hours i went just downhill throughout the day and they the um ambulance guys came out and they got to us after about four hours and they said we'll just take you into hospital because we think you may have an infection because all my vitals were fine. My oxygen levels are fine. Blood pressure was fine, which is bizarre when we're going to talk about what happened. So the, I couldn't get down the stairs other than on the backside because I couldn't balance. And the guy, the youth, the male um, guy in the ambulance, he helped me get out and sat in the back and had a general chit chat. Oh, you're a minister. You don't like a minister, all that usual kind of stuff. And then we walked in together into the ice, the um, emergency and as I walked in, they called my name and I want to turn around and say, yes, that's me. But nothing came out. And at the same time, the ambulance guy pulled up a wheelchair behind me and I just blacked out. So I, I black out. And the last thing in my mind is you probably got an infection. Real for 24 hours, because I was out for 24 hours, is race across London to try and get me the proper care and the right um emergency care and they tried to do what's called a thrombectomy where they remove a clot the clot in your head and what happened was i had a fourth stroke in a &E. if you're ever going to have a stroke a and e is the best place not that we're in charge of that but there we go so in the moment between when you wake up and you open your eyes you know the darkness you're seeing is the inside of your eyelids and you think to yourself i'm awake and then you open your eyes. But in that moment that I was to open my eyes, before I opened my eyelids, I heard the Lord speak to me, talk about perfect timing. <laughs> and he just said really, really simply, but very indelibly, you're going to be okay. So I opened my eyes, and suddenly I realized I'm in a hostile bay. I cannot feel anything. And when I mean anything, I mean the bed underneath me, the sheets on top of me, my fingers, my hands. I can't move my lips i can't speak i can't even breathe air is being pumped into me i can't even turn left or right to look around where i am i can just see in front of me and then these two australian ladies approach me come in through the um the uh surrounds of the, the hospital bay and 
And they begin to tell me what's happened. You've had a brainstem stroke. You're in St. George's Hospital in London, which is news to me. Obviously, the whole thing was. And then they said, we've been sent in to try and make contact with you. Now, that's what you say to an alien when they land on the planet. <laughs> so it's a very, very strange. And then they proceed to explain to me how to use an alphabet board by looking at the letters that they pointed out. And I had to practice saying yes or no and practice blinking once for yes, twice for no. And life began. It's a, a hazy 11 days. But then we, uh, I was moved out of those 11 days into a specialized straight ward in Lewisham. And I was there for two months. And during that time, a few little things in my limb that started to happen. So I began to get sensation back in my fingers, my toes, so my right can I, toe. Can, is there a Were you completely locked in? Is that what they call yeah. it? Locked in the syndrome. syndrome? They call it locked in. Yeah, sorry about it. Locked in syndrome. So the only thing you could move was your eyelids. That's it. My, it, it's, see, that's, yeah, scary. But it would have been scary if I had not heard the Lord. Yeah. Now, wow. you know, you know that there's hearing the Lord and there's hearing the Lord. Yeah. When you have heard the Lord with a capital L, it's so indelible. Yeah. That I just relaxed immediately. And I didn't worry about anything. I can't explain it to you, Jared. You can't make this up. Um, it was just so powerful. And that, pa the impact, the power, impression of it yeah. never left me for the entire 10 months I was in hospital. And I remember thinking to myself, this is going to be an incredible testimony. And it's proven to be so. Wow. TV, radio, everything, articles, the, the whole lot. And just giving glory to God, the way that he speaks to you in suffering, yeah. however terrible it is, when he wants to get through to you, he'll get through to you. Yeah. And so they get the doctors began to see starts improvement, and they felt it was worthwhile that I go to rehab. So rehab is a place where it's a hospital, but they keep you there caring for you night and morning. But in the daytime, you're actually doing loads of physical exercise. So I get there in this state where I'm wheeled in on a trolley with an oxygen tank helping me breathe. And I still can only move my fingers a little bit. And I can lift my knee a bit. And I can feel my shoulder, this shoulder a little bit. And my right ankle, which came back immediately after about two weeks, like perfect, nothing ever happened. And that was it. But within seven months, in seven months, on the 14th of August, 2020, I walked out of hospital. Wow. Wow. Oh, you said that in seven months. You made, that sound, you made that sound very quick then. But actually, yeah. that was a long, reading the book, that was a long it seven was. months. There's a lot of pain. There was a lot of um, tears. There was obviously COVID. I caught COVID yeah. and had a threat of death because everyone felt at that time, if you get COVID and you listen to all the briefings from down the yeah. street, you're thinking, am I going to die tomorrow? Yeah. But I couldn't, I couldn't accept that because I knew what God was doing. Yeah. And I was totally at peace with that. And I, although I was isolated and unfortunately um, a quarter of the people in the hospital died. Wow. So people were dying around me, including staff. People were disappearing there. So again, I'd already had people in Lewisham die in the bed next to me. So it was quite somber moments, but I, I couldn't really accept that I was going to die the next day or the day after. And I obviously I'm here today. So, yeah. And, and now, uh, what is it? A few years on, a couple of years on, I saw the other day you were mowing the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> well, Which, what's happened is... That was um, darned impressive. There's been a... At rehab, you learn, they they teach you a lot of techniques of how to operate around the home. Yeah. Um, obviously, the, the very first thing they start with is sitting up straight, and I couldn't do that. I was a sack of potatoes, my entire body was a sack of potatoes, and they would just push your shoulder with a finger, and you just fall over, and so they would keep you. And I did that, only that, for two weeks. Can you imagine that? For two weeks, from nine till five, doing mm. that. And then one day my body it just without me trying just went like that wow a very quick like that yeah and it took my breath away and the physio grabbed the the um, mirror and put it in front of me and i said do it again do it again and she pushed me and i self-corrected and it's wow. the first time and once you got that you then every single muscle in your body we got uh, i think nearly 600 muscles in their body yeah 
you start to doing strength building. Unfortunately, I had an athletic mindset and an athletic background. Yeah. A competitive spirit mindset. So yeah, I then started to exercise and stuff. And so since I've been released from hospital back home without a care package, I've been exercising four to five hours per morning. Wow. And doing mini stuff in the afternoon. But I've got so much stronger that yeah. I can now do the the walking. I've had an operation on my left ankle, which is really stubbornly slow to reconnect so it's now my foot is in the right place but still feels like complete jelly and that's why i wobble when i walk and but also you're speaking so you lost all of your speech yeah that, that, that journey because that sound that's a, a big one like the first moments you managed to talk to sam and things like that yeah i mean uh if you read the book you'll see exactly the day and the time that happened and, and her reaction um but it, every little thing how you breathe how you deal with all the saliva in your throat, all that's, you know, I had to live with the fear of drowning every day. Yeah. I had to have the, the um, saliva in my body sucked out of me about eight or nine times a day, five or six times a night. Wow. And it's a, if sounds strange to be, but it's a horrible, horrible feeling, but you get used to it. Yeah. My word. Strange. <laughs> May. It's just incredible. It is good to see you. Look, what, one little piece I liked, um, which showed that you were locked in, but you were still you. What was yeah. the first thing you asked when you when you woke up and you learned that alphabet board? I <laughs> love that moment. Come on, tell us it. Well, on the Saturday when I was going downhill, um, to try and take my mind off it uh, and the, the sensation and the feelings I was having, I watched the Grand Prix. The qualifying because i knew that lewis hamilton if he qualified and then finished in a certain position in the race he would be world champion and being an f1 support i've watched it all my life so my mindset was is he world champion so the very first question i asked was after a, a few stumbles at this is lewis hamilton world champion now on reflection i should have said something like i love you all my family i know you're outside <laughs> don't worry about me the lord has spoken but no, because I thought it was an infection and I wasn't right. quite processing everything. I just said, is Lewis Hamilton world champion? But as it turns out, that's the best thing I could have said because I told everyone I had memories. I was fully cognition. I was there. And yeah. and my dad just said, that is my David. Wow. So, yeah, it was a fantastic thing. Incredible. And Lewis Hamilton, actually, my a friend of mine called Lewis, who's a cameraman, he's done quite a bit of work with Mercedes, bizarre enough. He told Lewis Hampton my story and Lewis sent me a, a signed cap. Wow. It's one of the photographs on my website. You can download that if you want, but yeah, it's there. We'll give people all the links for websites <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah, oh, yeah. and and for books. Let's talk a bit about the book then. Um yeah, we uh, and we'll do both your books if you don't mind. Just just briefly, and we'll give people links for these and all that. Yeah. Don't get excited, but so now how the process of writing this, how's that been? Um are well, you okay on a keyboard I, and stuff like that and yeah when i was um locked in and things started to move and happen um the nurses started to tell me you should write a book you should write a book now they didn't know that i already already written one which we'll talk about in a minute yeah but um i i i had already thought i i should write a story about this it'd be a great testimony but i didn't realize what a great testament it was. <laughs> Sam at the time was not so minded to look into locked in syndrome because all she read in her first day or so of searching was terrible things. <laughs> and so her sister read some stuff and they, they told me little bits when I was locked in, but they didn't want to give me bad news. And basically the bad news is that no one really recovers from it. Yeah. Very low recovery rate, isn't yeah, it? Extremely very low. And I was given 10% recovery rate. 10% recovery chance and that recovery was just not to die yeah live for 24 7 with with care in a mental institution in a care home or something and so when i came home one of the first things i was keen to do was to look into how serious it is and i did find other people that have recovered from locked in syndrome and in the social media age i found now we're up to 15 i found someone else a few weeks ago and spoke to someone on uh instagram 15 not in the uk 15 in the in world Europe, in the world wow in the in the last 15 20 years since facebook's yeah. existed 
So I then realized, man, this is really important. Yeah. I've really got to explain the mercy of what God has done here and how wonderful, yeah. wonderful. So in, in writing the book, basically I wrote it one handed because my left hand, as you can see, it's move. It's all moving, but it's just it's nowhere near as strong as it needs to be. Yeah, and it just slowed me down. So I would write two hands sometimes, but others one one hand. Yeah, but yeah, my brother who's a scriptwriter, um, he really helped me just just work some things out, pattern things yeah. out. I had a rough idea in my, my mind, but when I got just after COVID, I was given permission by the hospital to have weekend leave. And because I knew that I was going to write a book at the weekend, I started writing copious notes of memories and stories and things that had happened. And Sam had a whole book for, for the first three months that she'd been given by someone in a notepad. Yeah. So yeah. your mind is all jelly at the moment. Write everything down in the book and yeah. come back to it. And Sam wrote everything down. So actually, it's a really accurate book wow. of what happens. <clears throat> Yeah, because you literally go often date by date. You're leading. Yeah, that's school. right. Yeah, and yeah, I cried a lot. I did also laugh a bit. You know, there was there's some. Good... There's a lot of humour. There is, which again just shows the internal turmoil of recovery and what you were going through, and, yeah. and the swing back and forward, and and um, you've always had a good sense of humour. So yeah, just seeing it still in there, fighting. Well, the issue, Jared, was I knew that. I knew what was going to happen. I've been told I was going to be okay. Yeah. My yeah. issue was I didn't know how. Yeah. And that's what I was learning. It was very painful and hard and emotional. Yeah. And quite devastating at times. But under all, I had this inner joy. Yeah. And so I just saw things through the eyes of joy. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, look, you know, anybody, uh, I've read this, cried through it, laughed through it. Um, it is an incredible read. Where can they get? uh this book i'm gonna guess amazon yeah but you can also buy it on the publisher's website okay that's faithbuilderspublishing.co.uk and do forward slash shop and i think my book is like the third one down so uh and that's and they're quicker at delivering the paperback version on amazon but yes you can also get the kindle version on amazon and the Brilliant. paperback as well but yeah so and that's called don't get excited but by reverend david hazel and um and we'll put the link straight to your publisher too yeah. as well always support the small publishers and the big publishers yeah. i would say uh, as well as the amazons and all that um and then the other book that i i again had you finished this before all this happened because well, this, this is to come out in the middle of everything you're getting right into a big story here there's a big <laughs> context i had had an encounter with god yeah. in around 2000 and 14 about god's mercy yeah i come to the end of myself i'm an a1 alpha male everything's positive we're going to do this i'm very resourceful and it had basically taken 20 years i think since we since we parted our ways yeah and i got into ministry for god to break down the 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 toughness of the human spirit and I came to the morning, but about 5 a.m. I was praying one morning and I said, Lord, this is not a threat, but but I can't continue ministry unless you do something. I can't. God, I had three other ministries, youth work and stuff, church planting, which basically they hadn't failed, but they just said by a long way, not met up to the expectations that I've been led to yeah. believe and pray for. Yeah. And I wasn't really prepared to carry on. You know, where is the God of Elijah? as people yeah. pray sometimes yeah. for the Bible. Yeah. And, and that's my heart cry. And this prayer bubbled up inside me at 5 a.m. And it was very simply, Lord, give me a break. Have mercy on me. And I, when I said those words, I never, I realized I never said it in my life before. And suddenly all the scriptures went through my head of all the people that come to Jesus for miracles. They always cried out, have mercy on me. Yeah. King wow. David, full of the Psalms and a one alpha male fighting and fighting and winning battles, shedding blood yeah. but all the time. is so low. God have mercy on me. He might cry for mercy. And so a three year study began of mercy, but I kid you not from that day to about three or four months later, at ch my small church plant, my, so my small Baptist church of about 25 members grew by a third. Wow. Now that, is not big growth in terms of numbers, but in terms of church dynamics and how you yeah. operate, yeah. that's massive. In fact, a deacon said to me, I no longer feel, with a smile, I no longer feel like it's my church. I don't know everyone. 
<laughs> yeah. But now that's a really good comment. But it yeah. sums up, and we did nothing more. But God gave me a break. He had mercy on me, and our church grew. Wow. I was so excited, but I stopped asking God for mercy. I was just amazed. The phone would ring. Somebody would turn up on Sunday. One one time, a whole house church folded, and they walked in as I was preaching from the back to the front. They still walked in a line. And that's the kind of stuff you write wow. down yeah, and make yeah. up a story. But it literally happened. Yeah, It's incredible. So when I got to Belvedere, where I was in southeast London, I thought, I've got to write this down. And I had a sabbatical coming up to seven years of ministry. And I wrote it all down. And I I got Colin Urquhart, and I feel the National Christian Leader to write their, their comments about it, which I used on the back of the book. Yeah, And I started getting the front cover designed. And it was the front cover was going on, but the book was finally edited and all the recommendations had come in two weeks before my strokes. Wow. Wow. I'm not lying. So Amazing. obviously when I got out of hospital, I thought I got to get this book out. Yeah. Hence it's self-published. Yeah. And then I started to write, don't get excited, but, but they are linked together. So I put okay. a postscript yeah. at the very end, which explains something's happened. Yeah. So I didn't yeah. realize I was going to be the physical embodiment of mercy. My word. I thought my life testimony of saying God have mercy on me, help me in ministry would be a yeah. good testimony. But I had no idea that God was going to rash it up by tenfold and demonstrate oh. it. In ministry. Wow. All right. Look, so let's. So the majestic meaning of mercy yeah. again, I think Amazon, you can get that from. Yeah, the, only Amazon. Yeah. <clears throat> paperback and uh, Kindle version you can get from there. Um, but we're going to finish this interview in a moment and we're going to yeah. go into a second interview talking about how we get through traumatic times as Christians, yeah. as leaders, <clears throat> and even some of that mercy stuff, how God breaks us down from 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 ego to finding a place of mercy with boy, oh boy. Yeah, in, <laughs> in that sense, I can really relate to that story. God's had to do a number on all of us, I would guess. Um, but look, before we end, so we've got these two books. How are things developing now? Where are you aiming ministry? Because I know you're beginning to speak. Obviously, you've got books. Um, tell us what plans you've got or what things are unfolding now and how people can kind of be in touch with you. Yeah, well, I'm officially retired, um, receiving my ill health retirement pensions because I can't run a church anymore because my balance is still quite bad. If I don't yet drive, although I've just applied a few days ago to start that process. Wow. But I can preach. I can stand for an hour. I, we've been to Cyprus. We're going on holiday next year. I can walk wow. around. Yeah. And so preaching, my speech has got so much better. Yeah. And you saw it, what it was when I first came out of hospital to now. It's, yeah. you know, it's changed. I, beyond I saw you speaking at Kingdom Faith the other yeah, day. I saw right. the video. Uh, very articulate. That, that fiery preacher that I know from 20 years ago was in there. Was it 25 years ago? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Not able to walk around as much as I used to because I'm still yeah. holding on to the uh, lectern for dear, dear life. Yeah. But the transition for me is to move from pastoring where you preach the message yeah. every week, depending on the needs of your congregation and what the Lord is saying to you, to itinerant ministry. Yeah. So I've been preaching in other churches about twice a month. We're part of a Baptist church in uh, Surrey where we're members tithing, part of a house group, staying connected yeah. Uh when I'm preaching roaches there once a quarter, but that's because I'm preaching elsewhere. The pastor there has been so good in helping me rehabilitate. He's my age, my style, and it's just a real understanding. He's very pastoral and to help me do that. So yeah. yeah, that's what we're doing. I'm gonna keep writing. So I've got some more books coming out. Fantastic. No, brilliant. Oh, and we must get you up to revive sometime soon then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know so uh, are you in South London still? Is that yeah, where we're you are? Yeah, Okay. Yeah, if you if you pay my tra travel, I'll come for free because the Lord <laughs> said the Lord said to me in Belvedere, thinking about this book, it's not about the money, yeah, it's about the message, and I need to get this message out. Yeah, come on, absolutely. Well, David, thank you for being with us. We are now going to do a second interview for the tribe, our learning community, and we're going to go deeper into all the areas of how do we get through traumatic times. And uh, it's remarkable how you've come through. And I think Sam's going to join us too. Yeah, she is. Yeah. So that's going to be super cool. All right. So we'll end here. Thanks, David. <laughs>